So next is uh, uh, the Birnbaum's lecture. Uh, and uh, Bill Birnbaum was a professor at uh, the University of Washington from 1939 to 1974. He has done distinguished services to the university as well as to the society. He has served as the president of IMS uh, as well as the editor for the uh, journals of mathematical statistics, uh, which is the, uh, um, the previous one for um, uh, the annals of probability and the annals of stati uh, statistics are the offsprings for that uh, journal. And he passed away um, in 2000. And in his memory, a few years ago, um, a Birnbaum's lecture was uh, established for this Northwest probability seminar. And it's a great pleasure and honor to have um, Jean-Francois Lagau from University of Paris, uh, or say, to give this year's Birnbaum's lecture. <coughs> He's going to talk about continuous limit of large random planar maps. OK, thank you for the presentation. I also would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. So I want to talk about scaling limits for random planar maps. Uh, so planar maps are just graphs uh, embedded in the plane, or in fact, it will be more convenient to view them as embedded on the sphere. And the idea is to work with uh, random objects, so to pick uh, such a graph uniformly at random in a given class. I will be more precise in a while. And uh, to, to let uh, the size of the graph tend to infinity and to study uh, the scaling limit of these objects viewed as uh, metric spaces for the graph distance. Okay, so essentially, if you have a graph, it induces a, a metric structure, a distance on the vertex set. And if you take a graph which is larger and larger, you can rescale uh, the distance and hope to get a limit. And this is what I will try to explain in this lecture. Okay? Uh, so why is it interesting? Essentially, we, we hope that in, in this way we get a limiting uh, universal object um, in the sense that it's not going to depend on the uh, particular class of uh, descriptor objects that we start from. Okay? Um, we also hope that we get in this way uh, an interesting continuous model. This is what I will call the Brownian map, although, uh, as we shall see, it is not yet completely uh, identified in some sense. But essentially, if we can study this limiting continuous subject, uh, we also hope that we understand better the properties of the large discrete object, the large planar maps. Okay? So in a sense, this is very analogous to what we uh, always do in probability theory. We use um, a convergence of rescaled random paths to Brownian motion. And we know that Brownian motion is a very nice and important object. And we also know that if we understand well Brownian motion, we can derive information about long random path. Okay? So in some sense, we want to do something analogous. But instead of doing with random path, we are going to deal with random graphs. Okay? So here is a brief outline of the lecture. So I will insist in this second part on the main technical tool that we are going to use, um, uh, which is certain bijections between graphs and trees. Okay? And in the last part, I will try to present some more recent work about uh, geodesics in uh, these objects. Okay? So let me start with a brief introduction to planar maps. So as I said before, a planar map is just an embedding. A proper embedding means that edges do not cross. Okay. So a proper embedding of a connected graph, I should say a finite connected graph, uh, into the two-dimensional sphere. And something which is very important is that we look only at the shape of the, of the graph. So we are not interested in the particular embedding. We identify two embeddings if they correspond uh, via a direct homeomorphism of the sphere. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's really a combinatorial object. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here is an example of a planar map. So something which you can define because your graph is embedded is a notion of a face. Okay? Uh, so the faces are simply the connected components of the complement of the union of edges. So in this particular case, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven faces. 
Okay, you should not forget the external one because you are on the sphere. In fact, there is no external one. And I'm going to be interested in a particular instance of uh, planar maps, namely the so-called p angulations. Okay, so p is an integer, a fixed integer, uh, greater than or equal to three. And a p angulation is a planar map such that each face has exactly p adjacent edges. So in the case p equals three, this is a familiar notion of a triangulation. And in the case p equals four, this is what we call a quadrangulation. Okay? So this one, for instance, here is a quadrangulation. Okay? You can check that every face has uh, four adjacent edges. It's also true for the external face. It's also true for this face here. This may seem a little bit surprising, but when, when you have a situation like this, when an edge is completely contained, in, if you want, in, uh, is adjacent to only one edge, to only one face, we count it twice because we, we imagine that we go around the face like this and we meet this edge twice, okay? So uh, this face is also a quadrangle, okay? Okay, and perhaps last thing that I will need, I will need the notion of a routed map, okay? So routing a map means that I distinguish an edge which is also oriented. So for instance, on this picture, I show this edge and I orient it downwards. And then the origin of the root edge is called the root vertex, okay? So this is, in a sense, a combinatorial trick. It's much easier to, for instance, for enumeration purposes, it's much easier to deal with rooted objects. Uh, and one believes that this is not so important for, it does not make, make such a big difference for the problems I'm going to address. Okay, so, so this is just a simulation of a large triangulation, okay, drawn on a, on a surface homeomorphic to the sphere. So essentially, well, the idea now is, well, can we, here we have hundreds of edges, hundreds of vertices. Can we, in some sense, choose one such object at random, let the number of edges tend to infinity, and try to get some continuous limit, okay. So, what do I mean by a continuous limit? So this will be in the sense of convergence of metric spaces. So I will view my graph, my planar map, as a metric space. So this is very easy to do. I look at the vertex set, V of M. I can equip it with the usual graph distance. Okay? So the distance between two vertices is just a minimal number of edges on the path from the first vertex to the second one. And equipped with the graph distance, the vertex set is, of course, a finite metric space, okay? And now the idea is to, to choose the planar map M uniformly at random, for instance, here in the set of all rooted p angulations with n faces. Uh, so let me emphasize that we uh, identify two planar maps if they correspond via uh, direct homeomorphism of the sphere. So, Thanks to this identification, this set of all p angulations with n faces is a finite set. So it makes perfectly sense to choose, of course, one uniformly at random in this set. And we want to understand how this metric space, the associated metric space, behaves when we let n tend to infinity. Okay, so Mn is chosen uniformly at random, as I said before, in this set. And we expect that. Um, if we rescale the distance properly, so if you multiply the graph distance by a factor tending to zero as n tend to infinity, so you can imagine that you assign a length n to the power minus a to each edge instead of having edges of length one. So you do this rescaling, you expect that the rescaled metric spaces will converge when the number of faces tend to infinity towards a certain continuous limit, okay? And the meaning of this convergence will be in the sense of the gromov of distance, which I will recall in a while, okay? So before doing that, two, two remarks. Yeah, it's important to, to rescale the graph distance if you want to remain in the framework of compact spaces, okay? It's also interesting to study this convergence here without rescaling, okay? Uh, this leads, if you don't do any rescaling, you will get, of course, in the limit, you will get an infinite random lattice, an infinite random graph, and this has been studied by uh, various people, in particular, Omer Angel and uh, Odechram and others. But this is not what I'm doing here. Yeah, I want to stay, 
to have a kind of global limit and not a local limit. Okay, and as I said before, we expect some universality of the limit. It should not depend on the integer p. So it should be the same for, p for triangulations, for quadrangulations, or for more general random planar maps. Okay, so very briefly, I remind you of the gamma Forsdorf distance. So this is just the definition of the classical Hausdorff distance between compact subsets of a metric space. Now, if you have two compact metric spaces, which are not a priori subset of a bigger space, you cannot use, of course, the Hausdorff distance to compare them. But what you can do, you can just, there is a very simple idea due to Gromov, you can embed simultaneously your spaces into the same big space, okay? So, this is uh, the meaning of the picture. You have your red space E1, your green space E2. You try, you find embeddings Psi1 and Psi2. You can always do that of E1 and E2 into the same space. It's very important that these are isometric embeddings because they preserve distances. It's really copies of your metric spaces that you find into the same big space. And then once you are in the same big space, you can use the Hausdorff distance to compare uh, uh, your two spaces. Okay, so this is what you do. You minimize over all possible isometric embeddings of E1 and E2 into the same space, capital E, the Hausdorff distance between the embeddings. Okay, and this gives you the so-called gromov hausdorff distance. Okay, and it has nice properties, and in particular, if you look at the set of all isometric classes of compact metric spaces, you can check that the gromov hausdorff distance is indeed a distance on this space, capital K. This is not completely obvious. And moreover, if you equip K with this distance, you get well, a nice metric space, a Polish space that is both separable and complete. Okay? So now I come back to the, the problem I was mentioning in the beginning of the lecture. So it makes perfectly sense to study the convergence in distribution of the vertex set of my graph, V of Mn, equipped to the rescale graph distance, viewed as a random variable with values in this cap set capital K. Okay, so it's really the, the usual setting of having a sequence of random variables taking values in a Polish space, and you want to study their convergence in the distribution. Okay. So this problem, in fact, was stated, I think, first in this form for triangulations by uh, Odette Schramm in, uh, in his uh, ICM paper. Okay, so, well, I can immediately tell you what's going to be the right choice of A. So, of course, the parameter A is chosen in such a way that uh, the diameter of this space remains bounded. So, here the diameter of the before rescaling should be of order n to the power A. And it, is, it has been known for some time that the correct value of A is A equal one-fourth. Okay. At least for quadrangulations, but... As I said before, it will be the same for uh, p-angulations, in fact. Okay, so very briefly, some motivations for studying planar maps. Because there are lots of motivations coming from combinatorics. Planar maps are important objects in combinatorics. Uh, they have been so, I think, since the work of Tut in the, in the 60s. Uh, there are motivations from theoretical physics. Uh, there are co deep connections between enumeration of maps and expansions for matrix integrals. And more recently, uh, large random planar maps have been used as models of random geometry, in particular in the setting of two-dimensional uh, quantum gravity. Okay? And uh, I can mention, uh, there's a recent work by uh, Bertrand Duplantier and Scott Sheffield, which is related to this, except that they don't deal with planar, work, planar maps. Uh, they use a different approach involving the Gaussian free field, but it is expected that in some sense, both approaches should be equivalent. Okay, of course, as I said in the beginning, there are motivations purely from probability theory. In some sense, you want to get a kind of analog of Brownian motion, but replacing path by graphs. So a kind of purely Brownian surface. Okay, mm -hmm. okay there are other motivations from metric geometry and also uh, motivations from algebra and geometry, but okay, I will not say more about that. Okay, so let me come perhaps to the description of the main technical tool I'm going to use, which depends on certain bijections between maps and trees. So I need 
two different notions of a tree. Uh, first notion is a notion of a planar tree or a plane tree. Uh, so here, well, for instance, you can view such a tree as a genealogical tree for a population that starts with an ancestor. Uh, I represented here the ancestor uh, by the symbol empty set. And then any individual in this genealogical tree uh, can be represented by a word made of positive integers in the obvious way. Okay? For instance, uh, the children of the ancestor are represented by the symbols 1, 2, and so on. So children of 1, 2 by the symbols 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3. So, okay? so it's an obvious definition. So you can simply define such a tree as a collection of these uh, words of integers. And this collection has to satisfy certain ob obvious rules, but uh, I don't state them. Okay. So what is important is the notion of a planar tree is the fact that, okay, first you have a root, of course, the ancestor here, and you have also an order, okay? Just the order is uh, put in the description of the tree, if you want. When you say that the children of the root are one, two, and so on, one is the first child, two is the second child, and so on. So you have a, a lexicographical order on vertices. Okay, so this is a very basic uh, notion of a tree, of course, in combinatorics. Now, slightly more complicated notion, what I call a well-labeled tree, it's going to be a pair consisting of a planar tree, first two, and then a collection of labels assigned to the vertices. Okay, so the labels here are the numbers in red on my picture. And they have to satisfy certain properties. Uh, the label of the root is always equal to one. Labels are positive integers. And when you move along one edge, the label can vary by plus one or minus one, or it can stay, stay the same, okay? So for instance, if you have an individual here with label three, its children can have label three, two, or four, but these are the only possible choices, okay? Okay. So why is this notion interesting? Because there is a nice bijection between these objects, well-labeled trees, and quadrangulations. So I consider this set capital TN of all well-labeled trees with N edges, and there is a bijection from this set onto the set of rooted quadrangulations with n faces. So for the moment, it's not saying much. It's just saying that both sets have the same cardinality. But in fact, you get more in the bijection. So this is explained below. You get the fact that if you start from a well-labeled tree, you can construct the associated quadrangulation capital M in such a way that the vertex set of the map is the same as the vertex set of the tree, plus one extra vertex, which I call partial D here. So vertices of the tree become vertices of the, of the graph. And moreover, which will be very important for us, uh, what was the label on the tree becomes the graph distance from the root vertex in the planar map. Okay, so you have this property here labels become graph distances when you go from the tree to the graph. Okay? So before I explain to use the bijection, let me mention that there are similar bijections for much more general planar maps, and for instance, for triangulations and so on. And these have been studied by various people, but in particular uh, by Boutier, uh, Di Francesco, and Guiter, who are theoretical physicists, in fact, uh, in Saclay. But I will stick to the case of quadrangulations for explaining this bijection because it's, uh, it is the simplest case. Okay. So here is an example. So you start from a well-labeled tree, it is here, and you want to construct this quadrangulation, which is here. Okay? Well, it's not yet constructed, but the vertices of the quadrangulations will be the, the red vertices here. So they are the same, if you want, of course, as the vertices of the tree, plus one extra vertex, which is here. Okay? So I start by adding this extra vertex partial D. And I assign to this extra vertex the label zero by convention. <coughs> okay? So now what I do, I, I follow the contour of the tree in the way indicated by the arrows here. Okay? And in this way, I will encounter, of course, every vertex of the tree. But more precisely, I will encounter every corner associated with the vertex of the tree. Okay? So you will see, for instance, this vertex here has three associated corners, 
one here, one here, and one here. And I will visit all three of them doing the contour. Okay? And the, the rule are as follows. So when I do this contour, so I start here from the bottom of the tree, from the ancestor. What I do, I, I connect this vertex to the last visited vertex with smaller label. Okay, so at the first step, of course, I'm at the bottom of the, the tree. I have a vertex with label one. Okay, I have to connect it to a zero. So there is only one, which is this extra vertex partial D here. So I draw this red edge here at the first step. Okay, but then what I'm going to do, I'm going to move this way. Okay, so I arrive here. I connect this vertex label two to the last vertex labeled one, which is this one. Okay? There is not much choice here, but later there will be some choice. OK, I continue. I arrive at this one. When I have a vertex label one, I connect it, in fact, uh, to the, ver the unique vertex labeled zero. Okay? So then I go down like this. So I visit again this vertex label two, but I visit a different corner now. Okay? So in fact, what I do, I connect it by an edge, starting from this corner here to the last one, which is now the vertex here. Okay? When I, I'm going downwards, arriving at this vertex two. The last vertex labeled one, which I have visited, is now this one. Okay, so this is why I drew this edge here. Okay, okay, and then, okay, three, I, I connect it to the last two, which is here. Two again, I connect it to the last one, which is here. One, I have no choice to zero, and you continue this way until you have explored every corner of the tree, until you have finished the contour, and you can check that. Now the graphs that you have constructed uh, uh, via, via this algorithm is indeed a quadrangulation. Okay? You can check that all faces have degree four. By convention, you root this quadrangulation at the first edge uh, constructed in this algorithm, uh, and in such a way that uh, the extra vertex partial D is the root vertex. Okay? So you root the quadrangulation here. And you can now verify, it, okay, at least on this example, that the, the red figures here, which were the labels of the, of the tree, okay? Question? Yeah. Uh, how do you make the connections? Where do you, how do you draw them in the plane? You said which edges to draw, but not the embedding in the plane. So it's, the, the tree is drawn in the plane. Right. The tree is drawn in the plane. What's important is that, uh, I didn't want to give too many details, but uh, if you ask me, what is important is that each time you, you, you draw an edge, I should maybe come back. OK, maybe. OK, well, what I'm doing here, I'm going down. I arrive at this vertex here. I draw an edge of the graph from this vertex to the last one, which is here. And this vertex starts from the corner at which I have arrived, OK? So th this is, I draw this edge here like this. And you can do that in such a way that edges do not cross. It's not completely obvious, but it's not very difficult to check. And there is actually a unique way of doing that. So your planar map is uniquely defined. I don't want to give too many details because uh, does it answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what I was saying that the red figures here, so which were the labels on the tree, you can check that they now coincide with distances from the root vertex. Okay? For instance, this vertex here had label three, and three is also the distance from this vertex to the root vertex, which is here. Okay? And this is true for any uh, other vertex. So now just to summarize, the, our strategy will be first to understand continuous limits of trees. This has already been done in some sense in order to be able to understand continuous limits of maps. But there is a, a difficult point, which is that, as I explained before, what you will understand in, in the graph, in the planar map, you will understand distances from one specified vertex, which is a root vertex, because they coincide with the labels. Okay? But of course, this is not sufficient if you want to, to get a convergence of metric spaces. You, you, you should be able to understand distances between any two vertices not only distances from one specified vertex. OK, so let me briefly explain the asymptotics for trees I'm going to need. So this is a theorem which is basically due to David Aldous. So you look at the set of all planar trees with energies. 
and you pick one uniformly at random in this set. I call it tau n. So again, you can view tau n as a metric space for the graph distance. Okay? The same kind of idea that I had before, but now I apply this idea to a, to a tree. Okay? So you rescale the graph distance basically with the factor 1 over square root of n. This converges in distribution in the gromov forsdorf sense, as before, towards a certain limiting random compact metric space, which is called, which is in fact the so-called CRT, or continuum random tree. Okay? So why this strange notation, TE, DE, it comes from the fact that you can view the CRT, and this is, in my view, this is perhaps the best way of uh, looking at the CRT. You can view it as a tree coded by a normalized Brownian excursion. Okay? So let me explain that. Perhaps first to, to give a rigorous definition of the CRT, I should introduce the notion of a real tree. Okay. So what is a real tree? Well, the formal definition is here. It's a compact metric space such that between any two points, A and B, you have a unique arc, meaning that there is a unique way of going from A to B in a continuous and injective manner, of course, up to reparametrization. Okay. Okay, there is a unique path from A to B if you want up to reparametrization. If you require your path to be one-to-one uh, -one and, uh, and continuous, of course. And moreover, if you choose, if you choose suitably the parametrization, your path is isometric to a line segment. Okay? So this is the definition of a real tree. You should think of a real tree as a union of line segments, just as in the picture which is there. Uh, of course, this union has to be connected. It has to be a tree in the sense that you will have no loops. Uh, it has to, to have the shape of a tree, if you want. Uh, but then you, you get, if you look at such a union of line segment, if you equip it with the appropriate distance, the distance between A and B here has to be, for instance, the length, of, of course, of the red path, which is here, then you get a real tree. Okay? So really, any compact real tree, I'm going to look only, in fact, here at compact real trees, any compact real tree can be obtained as a limit, an increasing limit, if you want, of finite union of segments, such as on this picture, of course. But, of course, it can be much more complicated than this. You can have infinitely many branching points, and you can have even uncountably infinitely many leaves. But basically, you should think of a real tree as an object like this, OK? So in the discrete setting, it is well known that you can code the planar trees, which I introduced before, by dig paths or contour functions. And in fact, you can do the same for real trees. Okay, so this is the next slide. You can code a real tree, and in fact, you can code any compact real tree by a function in the following way. So here I start from the function. Okay, you have a function g, which uh, is non-negative, defined on the interval 0, 1, continuous, of course, which starts and finishes at 0. So this is the red function here. And you can associate with this function a real tree. So the, perhaps I should give the, the intuition be, behind the construction. You, you imagine that you, your, the red graph here is a strip of paper. And you put some glue below this strip of paper. So below the graph, you put glue everywhere. And then you imagine that you, you squeeze the graph like this. You push the, the right side onto the, the left side, if you want. And so what's going to happen if you do this operation? So what's important when you do this squeezing, you, you keep the vertical distances. Okay? It's very important that you don't change the vertical distances. So what's going to happen is that two points which are at the same level below the curve, so then this point and this point, and, on your strip of paper, are going to be glued together. Okay? And if you do this gluing, it's not hard to imagine that you get a tree. For instance, in this example, it would be a very simple tree, in fact. Okay? But the, the precise mathematical definition is there. What you can do, you can define a pseudo distance on the interval 0, 1. Dg of st is just g of s plus g of t minus twice the minimum of g between s and t. And you glue, well, this is not a real distance. It's only a pseudo distance. So there are, you can have s different from t and dg of st equals 0. But what you do, you identify, say, t and t prime if dg of t, t prime is equal to 0. It's just the same as saying that g of t is equal to g of t prime and is equal to the minimum 
between t and t prime. Okay? So then, as usual, what you can do, you take the quotient space of 0, 1 for this equivalence relation. You equip it with dg, which is now a distance, and you get a real tree. Okay? Something which is also important, and you can have a convention for routing this real tree. You, you root it at the equivalence class of 0. Okay? Something which is important in this construction is that you also get, uh, using this construction, you also get a lexicographical order on your tree. You will say that the vertex, which is the equivalence class of S, comes before the vertex T, if S is smaller than T, simply. Okay? The same lexicographical order we had for discrete trees before. You also get it for real trees, in fact, via this coding. OK, so now I can just, it's just a restatement of Aldous theorem. In the limit, uh, uh, what you get is a random real tree coded by a Brownian excursion of length 1. And uh, this is a CRT. Okay? So informally, you should imagine that you have your tree. If you could define what it means of making the contour of your tree like this. And if you would record the distance from the root in this evolution, you would get the Brownian excursion. This is the intuitive idea. OK, so this was just limits of trees. Now I have to, to speak uh, about limits of labels. Okay? Remember in the discrete setting, we had labels assigned to the vertices of our plane trees. Okay? So I want to do the same now for my continuous trees. OK, so of course this CRT here is a tree coded by a random function, of course. So it's a random real tree. So, but I, I start by considering a, a deterministic real tree here, capital TD. So something you can do very easily uh, is just looking at Brownian motion indexed by the tree. Okay, so this is, well, it's a standard definition, if you want, of Brownian motion indexed by the line, except that you replace the line by, by a real tree, but otherwise it's exactly the same. So what, the, what does it mean? It just means that you, you run independent Brownian motions along the branches of your tree. The labels evolve like Brownian motion when you uh, when you move along the tree, okay? But of course, if you, if you look at two different line segments, two disjoint line segments on your tree, you have to use independent Brownian motions uh, uh, to describe the evolution of labels, okay? Okay, so you can do that for any real tree. If you have some mild uh, conditions on, on your real tree, you can prove that there is, there is a con continuous modification of your Brownian motion indexed by the tree. Okay, so this looks similar to what we had in the discrete setting. Remember, in the discrete setting, we, the labels could move, uh, could change by plus one, minus one, or zero along each edge. So it was a kind of tree-indexed random walk. So what I'm doing in the continuous setting, I look at tree-indexed Brownian motion. Okay, just the same, except that we lost the positivity constraint. Okay, if, if I look at Brownian motion indexed by the tree in this way. Of course, it's a Gaussian process. It's not going to be positive. It starts from, from zero at the root. OK. So we have to do something else uh, to take into account this positive quantity constraint. And it turns out that there is something very simple we can do. The, the first idea would be just to condition the labels to be non-negative. Okay? Uh, in fact, it works. But there is an, an even simpler construction, which I'm going to explain in the next slide. So I will state, in fact, the scaling limit for well-labeled trees. So just to remind you what was a well-labeled tree, you know, this plain tree with the red labels, which were positive and uh, satisfied the, the rules I explained before. OK, so we take one well-labeled tree with energies uniformly at random, so theta n, ln v, ln v are the labels. So we rescale the tree by 1 over square root of n, just as in I'll do theorem, of course, it's not a surprise. And we rescale the labels by 1 over square root of square root of n. OK, so why is it so? Remember what I just said? In some sense, the labels evolve a little bit like three indexed random walk, if you forget about the positivity constraint. Okay? So since the height of the tree is of order 1 over square root of n, oh, sorry, the height of the tree is of order square root of n, typically, if you look at the value of a label, it will correspond to the value of a random walk at the time of order square root of n. Okay? And a random walk, well, a centered random walk, of course, at time square root of n 
is of order square root of square root of n. So this is where we get this n to the power one fourth, which is very important. Okay. Okay. So now, if we do this rescaling, we can find a, uh, explicitly the form of the scaling limit. And what we get, well, the limit for the trees is a CRT. It's not completely obvious, okay? Uh, I will explain that in a while. And for the labels, we don't get Brownian motion indexed by the CRT, but we get a process which I call Z bar. So this Brownian motion was defined uh, on the previous slide, yeah, for a deterministic tree, but you can take the CRT, of course. So what you get is this process conditioned to stay positive, and there is a, a simple way of doing this conditioning. What you do, you define Z bar as Z minus its minimal value. So in this way, it's obvious that it becomes non-negative. And I said that the limit was not exactly the CRT. Well, it is a CRT, but you have to change the root. Okay, you have to reroute the CRT at the vertex at me, what I call here rho star, which minimizes the labels. Simply because in, if you want in the continuous limit, you also want the, the root to have a minimal label, which was true in the discrete setting. Okay, so you have to change the root of the CRT. Okay. Okay. But otherwise, this is a scaling limit. This already gives you a lot of information about distances in a random planar map. Okay, because remember that these labels corresponded to distances from the root vertex. Okay, so here is a theorem, for instance, which was proved by Chassin and Schaeffer, saying that if you look at the maximal distance from the root is in a random quadrangulation with n faces, you can rescale it by n to the power minus one fourth. So if you use the bijection between quadrangulation and trees, the maximal distance from the root corresponds to the maximum label. Okay, so this one four here, of course, is one fourth, is the same as the one fourth here we are using to rescale labels, of course. Okay. Okay. And you get okay, a more or less explicit form uh, for the limit in distribution in terms of Boyan motion indexed by the CRT. It's possible, in fact, to compute, to have some, to compute moments, for instance, to have a kind of Laplace transform, to have some information about the limiting distribution. Okay. So let me immediately mention, in connection with uniformity, that this result has been extended to much more general planar maps, including triangulations. And in fact, also random planar maps where faces do not all have the same degree. We can have different degrees, uh, in particular by Gregory Miermont and his uh, course. OK, so the next section, I will come back to the problem I started from, uh, the problem of the scaling limit of random planar maps, okay? So this is just to remind you of the notation. So I look at all rooted 2p angulations with n faces. It's very important that I take only here even integers, 2p, okay? This is a so-called bipartite case, okay? So this does not include triangulations, although, although it's very likely that the results I'm going to, to state also hold for triangulations, okay? So I pick one uniformly at random in this set. I look at its vertex set. I rescale the graph distance by one over n to the power one fourth. So CP is just a constant depending on P. And we get a convergence in distribution towards a certain random compact metric space in the sense of Gromov-Hausdorff distance. Unfortunately, it's only a sequential limit. Okay? So there is a compactness argument there. You get this limit at least along a, a subsequence. Okay, I will come back to that in a while. Okay. Still, you can describe the possible limits in a fairly explicit way. You can show that the limiting space is M infinity, which I'm going to call the Brownian map later, is a quotient space of the CRT. Okay, T. And, well, so here I have another equivalence relation. This equivalence relation on the CRT is defined in terms of Brownian labels on the CRT, or Brownian motion indexed by the CRT. So I use the same notation as before. Z is Brownian motion indexed by the CRT. Z bar is Z minus its minimal value. And now I define the equivalence relation by saying that two vertices are equivalent if and only if they have the same label, and if between A and B, the labels are larger. This is, in fact, similar to the equivalence relation we used uh, to define the coding of trees by functions. Okay? But 
here it's in a different setting. So I should say what it means here to say that C is between A and B. C belongs to the interval AB. It makes sense because, as I said before, we have also a notion of lexicographical order on the tree. Okay? So we can make sense of this interval here. OK, so now this M infinity is completely defined. It's the CRT quotiented by this equivalent relation. Now, what is capital D now? Well, of course, D is a, is a distance on M infinity. We can prove that it induces a quotient topology. We can prove several bounds on capital D, upper and lower bounds. And we can also prove that the distance uh, between any vertex A and the root rho star is a label of A. So it's just similar to what we had in the discrete setting. But we cannot, I cannot completely identify capital D. Okay? That's still an open problem. Okay? But we have some information. Okay, so, so before I discuss this open problem, let me explain to you perhaps why we have this equivalent relation here uh, that comes up. Okay? So you have to remember the discrete setting. Okay? In the discrete setting, when we, we, did we draw such an edge between two vertices U and V, we drew such, a, such an edge when U was the last visited vertex before V with smaller label. Okay? So you, this means that an, in the interval between U and V, all the labels, all the labels of these red vertices here, are at least as large as the label of V. You imagine that you go backwards on the tree, and the first time you meet a vertex with a smaller label is this U here. Okay? So this means that we have these properties, if you prefer. And now the, the definition of the equivalent relation in the continuous limit is just the analog of these properties in the discrete setting. Okay? So what's happening, if you want, in the, when we pass to the scaling limit is that we will have this property here between two vertices U and V, which are very far away from each other. This will happen from time to time. And saying now that they are connected by an edge in the quadrangulation or in the planar map, well, this means that in the scaling limit, because uh, distances are rescaled by a factor tending to zero, this means that in the scaling limit, they have to be identified. So this is the reason for this identification. Okay. Of course, what's difficult to prove is the converse, that you don't, don't identify more than this. Okay. In a, in a sense, you don't identify, identify so many points. A typical equivalence class is a singleton. Okay? And you have only countably many equivalence classes with three points, in fact. Okay? But the, the typical case is singleton, because okay? you don't identify anything. OK, so as I said before, you, at least you, you don't identify really the limit, but you identify its topology, just a quotient topology and this quotient. And the open problems are just to identify capital D. If one is able to identify capital D, this would imply that you don't need to take subsequences in my theorem. Okay? And otherwise, you, of course, you would also want to prove that capital D does not depend on P, that you have this universality property. Same limit for triangulations, quadrangulations, and so on. Okay. Uh, okay. Although the limiting space uh, it's not completely identified, the space M infinity D, you can prove a lot about it. Okay? So this space is called the Brownian map. The name was given by Marker and Mokadem, who, who had a different approach to, to the same object, in fact, not, not dealing with the gromov hausdorff convergence. And here are, for instance, two theorems you can prove about the Brownian map. You can prove that its Hausdorff dimension is, is equal to 4 almost surely. And you can prove that almost surely it is homeomorphic to the two sphere. Okay? So in a sense, this is not totally surprising because you start from graphs drawn on the sphere. You put more and more vertices, more and more edges. And in the limit, you get something which is homeomorphic to the sphere. Okay? Not a big surprise, maybe. But still, it's not obvious because you could, uh, you could imagine that in your random graphs, you could have bottlenecks like this. In cycles such that both cycles of both sides sorry, of the cycle uh, have a macroscopic size but such that the length of the cycle is small in comparison with the diameter of the graph. Okay? And what this theorem tells you, in fact, is that this does not occur, in fact, for large uh, planar maps. OK, so in the last five or seven minutes, I, I want to, to talk about more recent results uh, concerning geodesics in the Brownian map. And maybe I can start by describing what happens in the discrete setting. Okay? 
there it's very easy to, to understand how to construct geodesics, while say to the, at least to, uh, to the root vertex, from any vertex going to the root vertex. Okay? So you use the bijection, which I explained in the case of quadrangulations, but there are more general bijections. Okay? So what you do, you start from V, and I explained before, you, you, you go backwards on the tree, you look for the last visited vertex before V with a smaller label, with label LV minus one. Okay, so for instance, in this example, it's going to be V prime. Okay? And then you start from V prime and you do the same. You go backwards on the tree like this. And V second is the last visited vertex before V prime with smaller label. Okay? And so on. And if you do that, remember that the label corresponds to the distance from the root vertex. Each time you decrease by one the distance from the root vertex. So in the end, of course, you will reach the root vertex and you will get a geodesic. Of course, geodesics are not unique. And you can see that they are not unique because when you arrive at a vertex like this, which is not a leaf of the tree, you, you, you can't cross the tree in some sense. You can continue, decide to continue this way, or you can, as I did on the picture, you can explore what is above also. Okay? And this is why you don't have uniqueness of the geodesics. <laughs> but this is the way you, you get geodesics from the tree, if you want. Well, now you can do exactly the same construction in the continuous setting. Okay, now you have this CRT. It's important that you have the lexicographic order on it. And then you, you start from any vertex A here. So it has a certain label, this Brownian label, Z bar A, which coincides with the distance from the root. And you go backwards on the tree, and for every t between 0 and Z bar A, you look at the first vertex that you meet uh, going backwards from A on the tree, which has label T. So it's exactly the same as in the discrete setting. Okay? And, uh, but of course, now it's a continuous curve. Okay? It's indexed by T in the interval 0 from between 0 and the Z bar A, which is a distance uh, between A and the, and the root. But essentially, by the same formula in the discrete case, you get a geodesic. And this is called a simple geodesic. OK. Now, there is a, a nice fact, which is really the, the key point. Uh, the fact that, except possibly as a starting point, simple geodesics will visit only leaves of the CRT. Okay. So remember what I explained in the discrete setting. I explained that the non-uniqueness of geodesics was linked to the fact that arriving at a vertex which is not a leaf, you had several choices. Okay. And, uh, here, because you visit only leaves, at least informally, you can guess at least that for simple geodesics, you will have kind of property of uniqueness of geodesics. Okay? And this is what I will explain now. If you have a leaf of the CRT, you get a unique geodesic, well, a unique simple geodesic, at least. If you start from a point which is not a leaf, say, for instance, this one, you can start well, either from the left or from the right. This makes sense. Okay? I should define it in a more proper way. but you, you can construct two distinct simple geodesics and even three simple geodesics when you have a branching point. Okay? So I'm using the fact that you cannot get more because three is a maximal multiplicity. Okay? So the key result also now is the fact that in this way you get all geodesics to the root. Okay? So here is the main result about geodesics. So I need to define the skeleton of the CRT. The skeleton is just the CRT minus its leaves. It turns out that uh, if you look at the, the projection, the canonical projection here from the CRT onto the Brownian map, remember the Brownian map was this quotient, this uh, projection restricted to the skeleton is a homomorphism. Okay? This means that you, you are not identifying any point of the skeleton with a different point. Okay? If you want uh, the only point that can be identified in this quotient are leaves of the CRT. Okay. So you can prove that this, okay, I call scale the image of the skeleton under the canonical projection. You can prove that scale has dimension two. So in a sense, it's a very small subset of the Brownian map. So recall that the Brownian map M infinity had dimension four. Okay, so this scale is a kind of it's, okay, still it's dense the Brownian map. It's a kind of dense tree embedded in the Brownian map. Okay. So why is it important? Well, 
what you can prove is that this at scale is exactly what geometers may call the cut locus of the Brownian map with respect to the root. It's a set of points where you don't have a unique geodesic to the root. And in fact, what you can prove is that if you take a point x in scale, the number of distinct geodesics to the root is exactly the multiplicity of the point in the skeleton. Okay? Remember that scale is homeomorphic to a tree, so the multiplicity just makes sense as a multiplicity in the tree. Okay? Okay? So this result is very analogous to classical results of, classi of a Riemannian geometry, which go back to Poincaré and others. Uh, the cut locus is always a tree for a surface which is uh, homeomorphic to the sphere. I should mention that uh, you have, uh, so the, the root does not play any special role here. The same result holds if you replace the root by a point, a typical point in the Brownian map. Okay, uh, I think I have one, one minute. So, so other things you can deduce from this result is confluence property of geodesics. If you have two points, x and y, if you take any, well, suppose that x and y start outside a big ball, of a, a ball of radius delta, and you take any geodesic from x to the root, any geodesic from y to the root, they have to merge at some point, say, uh, before hitting this smaller ball uh, around the root. Okay. So in some sense, there is just one germ of geodesic starting from the root, and the same holds for any typical point. Okay. Okay, so maybe I will go very fast now because my time is over. You can apply all these results also to uniqueness of geodesics in discrete uh, planar maps, in discrete graphs, okay? Of course, th there you don't get uniqueness, but you get a kind of microscopic uniqueness. So this corollary tells you, for instance, that uh, if you take a point uniformly at random in the vertex set of your graph, of course, you will not have a unique geodesics, but any two geodesics will be close at another smaller, small in comparison with the diameter of the graph. Okay, so you have a kind of microscopic uniqueness. And you can also study points, exceptional points, where you have, don't have macroscopic uniqueness. You can show that you have at most three macros macroscopically different geodesics for exceptional vertices in your planar map. Okay. okay, so I think I should stop now. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker from the, the north this year. Um, we have Gordon Slade from UBC, and he's going to be talking about uh, weekly uh, self-avoiding walks in four dimensions. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you today about this uh, recent and ongoing work with David Bridges, my colleague at, at UBC, about four-dimensional uh, self-avoiding walks. So let me start just by reminding you uh, a little bit about ordinary self-avoiding walks. So um, think about the discrete time model first, although I'll want to go to continuous time shortly. So Sn of x is the set of all self-avoiding walks in Zd of length n that start at 0 and end at x and take nearest neighbor steps. That's the Euclidean distance. And uh, this condition is the condition that the walk not intersect itself, so that that's what makes it into a self-avoiding walk. So Sn of x is a set of all n-step self-avoiding walks that start at 0 and end at x. And Sn is the set of n-step self-avoiding walks that start at 0 and end anywhere. Um, we'll, in we'll be interested in the cardinality of these sets. So Cn of x is the number uh, of n-step self-avoiding walks from 0 to x. Cn is the number of n-step self-avoiding walks that start at 0 and end anywhere. And there's an easy sub-additivity argument that tells you that Cn is growing exponentially in the sense that the nth root of Cn converges to a limit mu, which is called the connective constant. And uh, the measure that I want to put on the set of self-avoiding walks of length n is just the uniform measure. So I look at the uniform measure on Sn. So that means that each self-avoiding walk has probability 1 over the cardinality of Sn, which, which is Cn. Another interesting quantity is the two-point function. You know, when you have a combinatorial problem like this, it's often useful to go to generating functions. 
So the generating function uh, is this power series with coefficient cn of x. Uh, we'll call that g sub z of x. And this, for every x, turns out to have radius of convergence uh, zc, which is, is 1 over mu. So cn of x is growing like mu to the n for, for all x, uh, not just cn. Now, um, what I'm interested in is critical exponents. Uh, and these are concerned with the asymptotic behavior of various questions that you could ask about the, this problem, like cn grows like mu to the n. We know that here. But uh, what about corrections to that leading behavior? And there's a critical exponent gamma here, which is predicted to exist and has been measured numerically in um, all dimensions. And um, the mean square displacement, so this is with respect to that uniform measure on Sn. What's the expected distance squared? That should grow like n to a power, which is called 2 nu. And if we look at the two-point function right at the critical value zc, this 1 over mu, which is the radius of convergence, then uh, it should be finite and decay as x goes to infinity to, according to a power, which is written 1 over x to the power d minus 2 plus eta. So this uh, gamma, nu, and eta are examples of critical exponents. They're, they're not independent. At least that's the prediction. There's a, a relation called Fisher's relation. It comes from the sort of physics arguments that tells you that they're um, they're related by that equation. So I'll show you a picture. This is a random self-avoiding walk in, on the square lattice that takes a million steps. Uh, this is a figure by Tom Kennedy. And what you can see is that it doesn't look anything at all like a Brownian motion. It's not like an ordinary random walk path would look like. An ordinary random walk path uh, would look like a plate of spaghetti. Uh, and, and this doesn't look like that at all. So it's different. But in high dimensions, they look the same. So uh, you can come up with a rough argument that tells you that in more than four dimensions, self-avoiding walks should look like Brownian motion, uh, like this. You, so there's more than one way to do it. But maybe the, the easiest is to say that random walk paths are two-dimensional. And two two-dimensional objects don't want to intersect generically in more than four dimensions. And so if you tell a random walk not to intersect itself, it won't care in more than four dimensions, and it'll just be a Brownian motion. So that is uh, hard to prove. <laughs> uh, but there's uh, some theorems uh, that many people have worked on over the years uh, that say that um, Cn is growing purely uh, exponentially uh, to leading order, that the mean square displacement is linear in the number of steps. The critical two-point function has the same behavior as the green function for random walks, 1 over x to the d minus 2. And you have convergence and distribution to Brownian motion. So these are old results. And um, what I want to talk about today is what's happening in four dimensions. Th these results were proved by lace expansion techniques, which do not extend to four dimensions. They cannot be applied. Now, the prediction from physics is that the upper critical dimension is four. Well, that's also that little argument that I just gave you. Uh, and that the um, asymptotic behavior for four dimensions has log corrections to these uh, relations here, especially these two. In that cn should grow like mu to the n with a log correction, not, a, not an n to a power, but log n to a power. And the mean square displacement should be a little bit bigger than n, but not that much bigger, just a power of logarithm. And well, for the critical two-point function, actually, there's no logarithmic correction. That's what the prediction is. This goes back to renormalization, non-rigorous renormalization group methods um, from almost 40 years ago. And these logs appear also in the susceptibility, which is just the, the generating function for the sequence Cn. Uh, it will diverge as Z approaches Zc from below linearly, but with a log correction. And the correlation length, which is the, uh, related to the exponential rate of decay of the subcritical two-point function, this E1 here is a, a unit vector in the one direction. Uh, so Gz uh, uh, at n e1 is behaving like e to the minus n over the correlation length. For z less than zc, you have exponential decay if you're below the critical point. That, will, that correlation length will diverge as z approaches zc from below uh, with a square root divergence and then also a log correction. So one would like to try to prove these things. Um, we uh, have been looking at a modification of the uh, this self-avoiding walk that I've just been talking about called the, the continuous time weekly self-avoiding walk. 
So uh, I'm, I'm going to describe it just in high dimensions here, which is what uh, I'm interested in. So you, you start with a continuous time simple random walk. So what that is, is it's, it's a process that uh, instead of moving at integer times, it moves at random times, which are separated by independent exponentials. So there's these exponential holding times for how long you stay at a place until you make a jump. And when you do make a jump, you choose uniformly from your 2D neighbors and, and move to one of them. So um, that's what this E0 is. It's expectation for that continuous time nearest neighbor simple random walk with exponential holding times. And then we introduce the local time of that process at a, a point u in zd, uh, which is just the total amount of time spent by the process at u up to time t. And then we form this intersection local time, i of t, which is the L2 norm squared of this local time at u. Now, if you write out this L u t as a, an integral and do it twice because it's squared, you have a double integral. And you can actually do the sum over u uh, to uh, eliminate one of the delta functions. And these are just Kronecker deltas. And uh, you'll end up with this expression here for the intersection local time. And you can see what, the, what this does is it's measuring the amount of time that the walk spends at the same place. And so um, it's a measure of how much intersection is actually occurring. Now we'll define the two-point function of this continuous time weekly self-avoiding walk in the following way. First of all, there's a parameter g, positive, which is giving the strength of the self-avoidance. We'll be looking at g's, which are quite close to zero later on. And uh, it's given by this expression. So what this does is it, let's look at the integrand here. It's taking the expectation with respect to this continuous time simple random walk started at zero. Uh, we're forcing the walk to be at x at time t. And then we wait a walk with e to the minus g times this intersection local time. So the more intersection that takes place, the bigger this exponent is going to be in the negative sense, and so the less weight that the path will have. Then we want to sum over t. That's like summing over n when we were discussing the uh, two-point function for the discrete time self-avoiding walk. Uh, so now we have to integrate over t. And we used to have a z to the n. Now, now there's an e to the minus nu times t, which is uh, playing that role. So this is the quantity that uh, I want to be studying. This is the two-point function. And well, you can apply a subadditivity argument to this uh, expectation here as well to see that the susceptibility, which would just be defined to be the sum over all x in zd of this two-point function, will be finite. Um, if nu is large enough, so that you have enough exponential damping here, uh, but it'll be infinite if nu gets too small. And we want to study what happens right at the critical value. And here's the main result. Um, so actually, uh, the title said d equals 4, but the method works more easily when d is greater than 4, so I'm including it here uh, in uh, the statement. There exists a g naught, well, which depends on d, such that if, if g is in between 0 and this g naught, then the critical two-point function uh, with that positive value of g will be asymptotically a constant over x to the d minus 2 as x goes to infinity with, with some higher order correction. In particular, there's, there's no logarithmic correction in four dimensions here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the method of proof that we use. Uh, but before doing that, I, I want to say that um, we, we think that the, this method has potential to do some other things that we're actually uh, actively working on right now. Uh, one of them is to prove the logarithmic corrections for the susceptibility and the correlation length in the case of d equals 4. We haven't achieved any of these three bullets yet, but they're things that we're, we're interested in and working on. And, um, Another one is to prove the same result also with a small nearest neighbor attraction. So this is a model which is used in modeling polymer collapse, a, a polymer in a poor solution. So a polymer in a good solution is measured by a self-avoiding walk. Uh, but a polymer in a poor solution, refer, the poor solution refers to the fact that the polymer cannot stand to be in contact with the solution. And so its only other option is to be in contact with itself instead. And so there's some competition between the self-avoidance, which tends to push the walk, make it bigger, and a self-attraction, which is making it 
want to be next to itself. And uh, that, that's a very hard problem, actually, that has um, not been solved very much. Uh, and uh, what uh, Roland Bauerschmidt, who's a student uh, at uh, UBC, has noticed is that the techniques that we use in the proof here um, can include the case of uh, nearest neighbor attraction, and that's something that is currently being investigated. Also, there's a model of self-avoiding walk, strictly self-avoiding walk in discrete time with a particular uh, weight associated to each step, and it's a long range steps. I think I won't talk more about that, but uh, this is something else that we're working on as well. Uh, the methods that we use are renormalization group methods, rigorous renormalization group methods that have been developed in the course of uh, some work that David Bridges has been involved in for about 20 years. Uh, including a paper with Evans and Imbri in 1992 and with Imbri in 2003 that uh, solved this kind of a problem and other problems including the end-to-end -end distance problem with those logarithmic corrections that uh, we saw earlier for the case of a four-dimensional hierarchical lattice. Now I, I don't want to say what a hierarchical lattice is here but it's a kind of a replacement of the hypercubic lattice by something with a sort of tree-like recursive structure that makes it more easily adaptable to renormalization group analysis. And so that was imp th th those were important precursors for what we've been doing. There's also a totally different approach uh, using different renormalization group methods by Hara, Takashi Hara and his student Ono. Uh, all right. Sorry, and what is this deep delta? Uh, delta is the Laplacian on the lattice. Yeah, I'll define it in a moment. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about the methods uh, that enter into the proof of the theorem. Uh, so we'll fix a, a g greater than zero and we'll usually drop it from the notation. And uh, we need to make a finite volume approximation. And actually it's quite easy using standard technique called Simon-Lieb inequality which may be familiar to people from percolation or easing model or other places. This has been around for a long time now. Um, that allow you to show that this critical two-point function on ZD can be written actually as the limit of a, of, of a two-point function which is subcritical. Nu greater than nu C corresponds to subcritical here because it's e to the minus nu. Um, so there's a, uh, two limits that take place here. There's an infinite volume limit and then there's a limit as nu approaches uh, nu C. So what is this uh, finite volume problem here? This is uh, doing the same two-point function on a torus. So r is some number which will be going off to infinity here, an integer. And lambda is, is the torus of side length r. And what this two-point function is, it's the same thing. It's the weakly self-avoiding walk two-point function on the torus. So this is the continuous time simple random walk on lambda. That's what this expectation is. And this is the self-intersection local time uh, on lambda. So we only sum over the vertices on lambda here. Those are the only vertices that exist as far as this finite volume uh, model is concerned. So I want to take this for granted and say that in order to study this critical two-point function on ZD, it's enough to study it on a finite torus and work a little bit subcritical, provided that we're able to do it with sufficient uniformity both in the volume and in nu that we can take these limits. Now, there's another formula for the two-point function. So the, this is a, a theorem that this finite volume two-point function can be written as a certain integral. And in order to say what that integral is, I need to make several definitions, which I think may look uh, unfamiliar to uh, some of you. So, Phi here is a complex field on lambda. So lambda is the torus. And phi is like a spin. Phi of x is like a spin sitting at x. And it's a complex spin. So it's not like an easing spin, which is plus or minus 1. It's, it's a complex field associated to the points in lambda. And phi bar, so if phi is u plus iv at x, then phi bar is just the complex conjugate. Uh, this delta is the discrete Laplacian on lambda. So it just uh, compares the value of phi at x with the values at its neighbors. Usual definition of the Laplacian there. And then 
we, we need to go to differential forms, actually. So associated to this phi x, which is sitting at a point x, we think of that as a complex variable, and associate to it a differential d phi x. And there's also a differential uh, d phi x bar. And there's some scalar which ends up going in front of them, which is just there so that it doesn't show up later. And then we define this differential form, which has a, a zero form, just a function here, phi x, phi x bar. And then there's, there's this two form, psi x, psi x bar, uh, which is multiplied together using the, the usual wedge product. And the wedge product is just a way of uh, multiplying together differentials, and it's anti-symmetric, anti-commutative rather. So that's the important feature about this uh, product is that it's anti-commutative. It matters what order you write things. If you change the order of two uh, adjacent differentials, then you change the sign. And if you want to write this in terms of the real coordinates, then you, you, can, you can write it this way. So in particular, psi wedge psi is equal to 0 because it's anti-commuting. So we have to define this tau x, which is this, uh, this form. And then there's tau delta x, which is another form, which is uh, kind of like tau except the Laplacian minus the Laplacian has been inserted on, in, in, on, on the four possible factors where it could be inserted here. Uh, then this wonderful formula holds that the two-point function for the weakly self-avoiding walk with continuous time is equal to this integral. Now this integral requires some interpretation. I have to tell you actually what it means. It's an integral over c to the lambda, so it's a very large dimensional integral. Uh, what you don't see at the moment in this formula is a measure showing up, and usually you like to see a measure when you do integration, so you know how to do the integral. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, or, or uh, what's, what's very delightful about this, is that the measure is actually up in the exponent. Um, so this tau u and tau u squared, uh, and by the way, I put the wedge in red here to emphasize it, and I'm never going to put it again. So when you see uh, tau u, uh, that's actually tau u wedge tau u. Um, now, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the differentials are up in the exponent, so we have to interpret that. And I'll, I'll say what that is on the next transparency. But this right-hand side is something which in, in physics would be called the two-point function of a supersymmetric field theory with a bosonic field phi and phi bar. So the phi and phi bar are the bosonic field. And the, f the differentials are, are the fermionic field. Differenti fermi fermions are anti-commuting objects. And uh, the differentials are, are doing that job here. This has a long history, actually going back 30 years to work of physicists Parisi and Surla and McCain in 1980, Luttinger um, from the mathematical side, Lejeune, uh, Bridges, Evans, and Imbri. And, uh, Bridges, Imbri, and I have a, a survey paper from last year on this topic. So I'm not going to tell you how to prove this, uh, but I'll try to tell you at least what it means. So, how, what, what is the meaning of this integral? OK, so the problem is we want to interpret it as an ordinary Lebesgue integral, uh, but the, uh, the measure is up in the exponent, and it's sort of all mixed up. So we want to bring it downstairs and straighten it out. So what you do is you expand the entire integrand in a formal power series about the degree 0 part. That's the part that doesn't have any differentials. So if you have a function of the differentials, then what you do is you just expand that function in a Taylor series. And that Taylor series is going to terminate, actually, as a Taylor polynomial because of the anti-commutativity. You can't uh, have, you know, you, you only have a, a psi and a psi bar at every point in lambda, and you can't, uh, you can't have a higher power than uh, 2 lambda. So uh, for example, if you expand e to the tau, tau was, was this, phi phi bar plus psi psi bar, then you just expand out the psi psi bar. Uh, so e to the psi psi bar, when you expand it, you just get 1 plus psi psi bar, because if you were to square it, you would get 0. So you keep only fact the terms with uh, one factor d phi and one d phi bar for, for each x in lambda, and then write those in terms of their uh, <coughs> real and imaginary parts, u and v, and do the same thing for the d phi and the d phi bar. Um, you're going to keep only the terms that have one factor d phi and d phi bar once you've done that big expansion up here for each x in lambda. 
And then you'll use anti-commutativity to, to rearrange the differentials so that you can write them as the product du1 dv1 times du2 dv2 and so on. And then you have a Lebesgue integral. And so then you just do the integral. So, I mean, in practice, this is not what you would do if you wanted to uh, evaluate one of these integrals. That's the way that it's defined. But instead, what you do is you prove properties that these integrals have that come out of this definition and use those properties in the analysis. And those properties tend to turn out to be really quite nice. So, for example, uh, if I define s of lambda to be the sum over x in lambda of that form tau delta, the one that had the minus Laplacian put in, uh, plus m squared times tau. Then if I integrate any function of tau that can be integrated, so this tau should be regarded as a vector whose components are tau x, so it's, it's a vector with, whose components is equal to the cardinality of lambda. So I have a function of tau at all of the x's. That, that integral just turns out to be f of 0, no matter what f it is that you're dealing with as long as the integral exists. And if you take uh, as a function that you want to integrate against this e to the minus s of lambda, this is s of lambda here, uh, phi 0 bar phi x, then you will just get minus Laplacian plus m squared inverse 0x, which is, I mean, the minus Laplacian was in here and the m squared is here, so it's coming out of, the, out of this s. So what will happen now is that we're trying to prove uh, the asymptotic behavior of the limit of this as lambda goes to zd and nu goes to nu c, uh, we're, we're going to work with the right-hand side from now on and simply forget about the walks from this point. We won't see any more walks. We'll just see the integral. Now, I have to do something uh, a little bit technical here uh, for the moment, but um, uh, it, it, the idea is simple. It's a change of variables. So in that integral, uh, I just want to, it's just, it's just ultimately a Lebesgue integral. I want to make a change of variables, uh, which is to scale, in, introduce a, a scalar here, square root of 1 plus z0, where z0 is just some real number greater than minus 1. Uh, then if you do that, uh, you end up with this, uh, this formula. So this is just a simple change of variables. Uh, I, I won't uh, belabor it, but you know, you had a, a, a phi uh, bar and a phi here, and together those are going to give you a 1 plus z naught that's popped out. And uh, the tau delta and, and the tau were quadratic in phi and phi bar, and d phi and d phi bar, and so they're also going to produce a 1 plus z naught. And this tau u squared is quartic in phi and in d phi, and, and so you'll get a 1 plus uh, z naught square root to the fourth power, which is where this comes from. Now, it's, it's very convenient very often in, in statistical mechanics uh, to uh, introduce an external field. And, and I want to do that here because that will allow us to move this phi 0 bar and phi x down from below up into the exponent. So, uh, well, there's various notation here that uh, it's, it's not so important to follow the details of it, but uh, essentially what is important is this sigma phi 0 bar plus sigma bar phi x, which has been introduced. So sigma is a complex field here. Well, it's not really a field. It's just, it's just a scalar. It doesn't depend on x. It's a complex variable. And it's been introduced so that when we write e to the minus s of lambda minus v naught of lambda here, then in that v naught of lambda is this term. And if we differentiate that uh, with respect to sigma and sigma bar, then what will happen is we'll bring down the phi naught bar and the phi x and recover the formula that we had here. So that's sort of the interesting thing which has happened in this line. Otherwise, it's bookkeeping. So there's this s of uh, lambda, which has been isolated here. The reason for introducing this m squared is that the uh, Laplacian is not invertible on the torus. Uh, and so we have to add a little bit of a term here in order to make minus Laplacian plus m squared invertible. So m squared is a positive number here. And you can see that actually it's related to taking the, the, the limit nu goes to nu c is related to m squared going to zero. So there was the, ultimately the limit as lambda goes to zd and nu goes to nu c that we need to take. Uh, that limit as nu goes to nu c will now be replaced by the limit as m squared goes to zero. So essentially what we want to show is that this green part, or the or green, this red part here, 
of V naught is like a small perturbation of S of lambda in the sense that, uh, well, that uh, it's not playing an important role. If it doesn't play an important role, if we were just to eliminate it, then uh, we, we can do this calculation and it's related to one of those properties that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and this limit just turns out to be minus the Laplacian inverse on all of Zd, which has the decay that we want. So our problem really is to show that this V naught is a small perturbation. Now I want to do, introduce a, a kind of expectation. It's not an expectation uh, like in normally in probability theory, but it has many of the properties. Uh, th these integrals behave very much like Gaussian integrals, ordinary Gaussian integrals, even though they have this sort of fermionic abs aspect to them with, with all these differentials all over the place. So given a positive definite lambda by lambda matrix C, uh, whose inverse is A, we'll define SA of lambda to be this kind of quadratic form in, in phi and in d phi. So the psi is, is basically a multiple of d phi, and so we're, we're, we're introducing this extra term here. And then uh, for a form F, uh, like the kinds of things that we've been integrating uh, on the previous transparencies, the expectation of such an F with respect to this covariant C will just be defined to be this integral. And it, it has the property that if F is equal to 1, uh, th this integral will be equal to 1. Actually, for any A, this is one of these marvelous properties of these integrals, is that they're self-normalizing. So th this, the integral of e to the minus S A times 1 is just 1, no matter what A is, as long as uh, it's positive definite. So it has at least that aspect of an expectation. So the A that we're interested in is um, minus Laplacian plus M squared. And then I could rephrase what it is that we're trying to compute in terms of this expectation just by writing that integral that we had previously, which was one of these integrals, now as an expectation. And we really profit by thinking of this as an expectation, even though we're working in much more generality than as usual in probability theory because uh, we, we want to do conditional expectations as well, in which case these, this expectation will have the value, uh, it, it'll be form valued. It'll be different, its value will be a differential form, not, not a number. One of the ways in which they behave like uh, ordinary uh, Gaussian integrals is, is with respect to convolution properties. So I, I want to uh, use the abbreviation, I'll write phi for the, for the pair phi, phi bar, and d phi for d phi, d phi bar, just with the different font. And, and just recall the, the basic fact that we teach our, uh, our students um, uh, as, as undergraduates, that if you, you can take a, a normal random variable with variance sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared, it, it'll have the same distribution as the sum of independent normal random variables with variances sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared. And that finds an expression also for, for these kinds of Gaussian integrals that we're dealing with here. Uh, another way of saying the same thing is that the convolution of two Gaussian densities is a Gaussian density. And so here, here's a kind of expression of that fact for these expectations that if I define theta of f, uh, so there's been a doubling of the field here. There's the original field phi and psi. Now there's another field, uh, psi, the boson field, and eta, the Fermi field. Uh, so we can add phi and, and uh, psi and eta and uh, psi and evaluate f on the sum like that. Um, so th what this integral does is it integrates out the psi and the eta, leaving phi and psi fixed, phi and psi fixed, rather. And then the second integral integrates out the, the phi and the psi. So this is a, a version of this uh, fact up here about ordinary Gaussian random variables which is going to be quite useful for us because what we're going to do is we want to evaluate the expectation with respect to this specific covariant C, which is minus Laplacian plus M squared inverse. We're going to decompose that covariance in an intelligent way into a very large sum of covariances and we're going to write the original integral that we're trying to compute as an iterated integral. And that intelligent decomposition comes from a result of Bridges, uh, Guadagni, and Mitter from 2004, which they used um, 
in uh, their hierarchical work. So it works for any dimension greater than 2. You fix some large L and suppose that the lambda, uh, the, the volume, this torus, has side length L to the n. And n will be going off to infinity. L will be fixed in large. Let C be minus Laplacian plus m squared inverse. Actually, they worked on, on Zd. Uh, it works. You can extend what they've done also for, to, to the torus. On Zd, you can take m squared to be 0. Uh, on the torus, you cannot. Anyway, it's possible to decompose this covariance as a sum of n covariances, c1, c2, up to cn, positive definite, that have the property of being finite range. That means that uh, cj of xy will be 0 if x and y are separated by distance uh, of order l to the j. And what that means is that the fields at points x and y are going to be independent as far as cj is concerned um, if, they, if they have such a separation. And moreover, <clears throat> except for the last one, which is special, so cn is a bit special. I don't want to talk about that. But um, up until you get there, the, the covariances obey very nice estimates. So there's this something called the dimension of the field here, which is 1 half of d minus 2. In, in four dimensions, you might as well think about four dimensions. The dimension of the field is just 1. Then the covariance is bounded above. So this covariance sub j is bounded above by l to the minus 2 times j minus 1. So the covariances are getting smaller and smaller. And so the fields that are distributed according to that covariance under the Gaussian measure with that covariance would be getting smaller and smaller. And, well, more generally, smoother and smoother. So if you, every time you take a derivative, a discrete derivative with respect, oh, that should be a y there, uh, with respect to either one of the entries of the covariance, uh, you get an, an L to the minus j minus 1 for every derivative that you take as well. So we'll use that fact. I want to use that decomposition of the covariance you get a decomposition of the fields. This corresponds to writing your Gaussian measure, your Gaussian random variable with um, uh, variance sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared as x1 plus x2. Uh, so now both phi and d phi become decomposed, though. So that, that's something that you have to prove, that it works also for these kinds of Gaussian expectations that I'm talking about now, but it does. Uh, so you can decompose the field like this in such a way that this expectation that you want to take is actually the convolution, or the composition rather, of these expectations, where expectation sub c1 will integrate out xi1 and dxi1 and so on. Second expectation will integrate out xi2 and dxi2, and by the time you're done, there'll be nothing left. So we want to write phi j as what is left to integrate after you've done j of these operations, and then you can well, just by this definition, you can write phi j as xi j plus 1 plus what's left after that one. And then we'll define these sort of partition functions. Z0 is e to the minus v0. That's what we initially have to integrate with respect to c. And here we have a kind of progressive uh, way of doing the integral where it's, it's only been partially done. The first j of them have been done here. And we'll call that zj. It will depend on phi j, what remains, what hasn't been integrated out, and the, the differentials that go uh, with that. And so what we need to do is to compute zn, which is the full expectation. And so we're led to study the so-called renormalization group map, which is the map that takes zj to zj plus 1 by doing the next expectation. So that's what we have to study. And this gives rise to a dynamical system. Now, when you're looking at a dynamical system, you want to know which directions are expanding, which directions are contracting, which directions are marginal and not doing either one. And it's, it's here that the dimension 4 comes in, in fact. So I'd just like to say a word about that. Let's focus, first of all, about d equals 4. And you look at those covariance estimates for um, cj plus 1. That, that suggests that this field that you're going to be integrating out with that covariance is of size L to the minus J, because the covariance was, was L to the minus 2J. And the covariance is just the, it's the variance, because these fields are centered. So uh, this field should have size, which is like the square root of the covariance, which is this L to the minus J. 
And moreover, because of the smoothness, that field will be roughly constant on a block of side length L to the J because the covariance was, uh, its derivative was, was, uh, was very small. So if you look at a block B uh, on, on, in lambda of side length L to the J, so this is a cube, then if you look at the size of that field raised to the pth power summed over that block, well, the field's roughly constant, and it's of size L to the minus J. We're taking the pth power. There's this many terms in the sum. That many means L to the 4 times J. And so this is L to the J times 4 minus P. And you see that this is an expanding direction if P is less than 4. This is going to be blowing up uh, as J increases if P is less than 4. It'll be marginal. It'll be order 1 if P equals 4. And it'll be irrelevant. It'll be getting smaller as J increases if P is greater than 4. And well, tau was like phi squared. Uh, tau squared is like phi to the fourth. And so those were the terms which were showing up in, the, uh, in this V0, the, the, this potential that has to be, uh, whose exponential has to be integrated. So this is, in a way, is explaining why we, we don't ever see any uh, tau cubed or tau to the fourth or higher order terms. And in fact, if you take other symmetries into account, uh, including the, the supersymmetry, which is a sort of symmetry between the phi's and the d phi's, then you find that the only relevant and marginal monomials are precisely the ones that shows up in, in the V0. So this is somehow saying that this V0 has put its finger on the right things to be looking at. <clears throat> and the role of d equals 4 shows up because if you look at tau squared, which is what multiplies g, that strength of the self-avoidance, um, you find that the tau squared term is, is relevant if d is less than 4 and irrelevant for d greater than 4. If you do the calculation, this is how it works out. And so what this means is that d greater than 4 is an easier problem than d equals 4, and uh, d less than 4 is a harder problem. All right, so we, we want to look at this map um, uh, E sub Cj which is taking us from zj minus 1 to zj. Let's just try and talk about the first one uh, before we move on to the general one. So what this map does is it takes a function of phi, uh, which is phi 1 plus xi 1, to a function of phi 1 by integrating out the xi 1 and also the dxi 1. So let's write z naught at a single site now as i naught of x, which is e to the minus v naught of x. V naught was this polynomial in tau x and tau x squared and tau delta x. And for a subset of lambda, define I0 of that subset to be the product of the I zeros, which because we're talking just about an exponential here will be e to the minus the sum over little x in capital X of V naught of little x, and I'm writing that in this way. So this is a function of phi. V naught depends on tau, which is a function of phi and d phi. Now, suppose I had some other uh, polynomial v1, uh, which is a version of v0 whose coupling constants are different. So instead of g0, nu0, and z0, I have some other ones, which I just get to pick. I, I want to pick them eventually in an intelligent way, but they can be anything for the sake of the argument that I'm presenting right now. And I want to regard this v1 as being a function of, of phi1. So essentially what I want to do is I want to think that when I take the expectation of e to the minus v naught uh, of lambda, I'll get e to the minus v1 of lambda. Now, I, I won't get that. There'll be some corrections. And I'm trying to now investigate what is the nature of those corrections, and because they have, all have to be controlled. So let's suppose that uh, we, we, we had some good guess for what v1 would show up. If you like, it's just the log of the expectation of e to the minus v0. Um, and we're trying to approximate it by a polynomial. Uh, Let's suppose that we have some good guess for it, and then let uh, delta i be the difference between i0 at phi 1 plus xi 1 and i1 at phi 1. Then we can take our partition function, uh, z1 of lambda, which is this expectation of, of i0, and write it as the expectation of the product of i0, and write i0 as i1 plus delta i1, because that's what it, it uh, turns out to be here. Uh, then 
this product can be evaluated. So when you take this product, basically you decide when do I take I1, when do I take delta I1. Um, that decision uh, is, is being recorded by this capital X here, which tells me when I took the delta I1. And this expectation only acts on xi1, which shows up only in the delta. And so I can pass it through the sum and through the I1 and write it in this form. And we end up with um, what's called the, the circle product representation. So this z1 lambda can be written now in this form. So here, here's the formula that I had a moment ago. What I'll do is x is represented by these little squares here. And we go to the next scale. So P1 is polymers on the next scale, which consists of um, blocks uh, on, on this large scale here. So P1 is some collection of blocks. And uh, I'm just essentially performing this sum by conditioning on what is the set of larger blocks which contain these points. So uh, here U is that set of larger blocks. Uh, this I1 is in the background. And K1 uh, will be what it needs to be in order to get the, that result. So we're kind of moving on to the next scale. And this formula is an instance of, of um, a circle product. So if F and G are, are forms which are associated to polymers, uh, so PJ are uh, an element of PJ is just a, a subset of the set of all blocks of size L to the J. And what we've got here is a kind of a convolution which uh, shares lambda among F and G. This defines an associative and commutative product. And it's possible to write uh, Z0 and Z1 in terms of this circle product. Now, I think I'm, I'm running short of time here, so I'll have to speed up a little bit. But um, here's the theorem. Uh, I, I'm stating it for d equals 4. There's a choice of coupling constants. So gj, nuj, zj, lambda j, qj. Uh, which determines ij according to some formula. So ij is kind of like a finite dimensional part of the dynamical system that we're following in detail. kj is an error term such that if we write zj in terms of uh, circle product of ij and kj, then when we move on and take the expectation, the new z is again a circle product of ij plus 1 and kj plus 1, where ij plus 1 is given in terms of ij by this dynamical system. And so what we need to do is to study that dynamical system. And we prove uh, a fixed point theorem for that dynamical system, which says that there's a, a choice of initial condition z0, which is something which shows up in the constant in the 1 over x squared decay of the two-point function in four dimensions, and nu0, which is what actually is putting us at the critical point, such that the solution of this dynamical system in the limits is driven to zero. This is what physicists call infrared asymptotic freedom. They're, they're very good at um, inventing names for things. Uh, and uh, from this, uh, we, and from well other ingredients, which I don't have time to explain, uh, we can simply do the calculation of the two-point function. Here's the formula that we had for it initially, and from that uh, integral representation. Uh, by the time you get to scale n, when you do the circle product, it's rather easy because it's a way of dividing up the space uh, between i and k. But uh, on scale n, there's only one block. And so either i gets it all or k gets it all. And k, uh, we show, is essentially 0 in the limit. And i, once all of the integration has been done, um, has no field left in it. And it's possible to do this calculation. And what we find is that uh, the limit is given in terms of the uh, inverse Laplacian on Z4, which has the decay that we want to prove. Thank you very much. So here the critical dimension is really four. It's not four and a half. It's four. Right. So is there a universal reason why critical dimensions must be integers, or must um, they not So, so th they're, they're not. Um, and uh, there was something that I skipped over here that uh, I really ought to mention, uh, if I can find it. Yeah. 
So what you can do is uh, take uh, as your underlying random walk, not the nearest neighbor walk like I did, but, but take a, a long range walk so that the, um, you know, that's something that would be converging to a stable loss so that the uh, weight associated to a step from here to a point x, which is distance uh, r away, would be like 1 over r to the d plus alpha. Uh, then if you, uh, as you vary alpha, then you have the effect of actually varying the critical dimension. And there's a formula for what the critical dimension is in terms of alpha. I, th I think it's 2 alpha. Uh, and there, there's something quite interesting here that, uh, that I didn't mention by Mitter and Scopola, a paper in 2008. So they did that with the choice alpha equals 3 plus epsilon over 2. That model has critical dimension 3 plus epsilon. And they actually work in dimension 3, which means that they're slightly below critical for, uh, for that model and are, have taken the first steps in constructing this renormalization group flow um, in that context. So, so that's quite interesting. It, it, it's analogous to studying the nearest neighbor model in dimension 3.999. Any other questions? You all. Continuing with this, so it seems maybe the simplest case would be to take a half-stable walk where the critical dimension is 1. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, would that case be easier? I don't think it's easier. So in, in fact, I, I've, I've talked to Mitter about this. And, and um, if, if you play with alpha, then you can make this DC uh, to be essentially anything less than 4 that you want. And if you, so if you choose the right alpha, uh, well, I guess it would be 1 plus epsilon over 2, uh, so that DC would be 1 plus epsilon, uh, then the problem is equally difficult. So it, 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 does, it doesn't get any easier, no. So in your result, you have this limiting G0 where it only worked for G up to G0, but you expect that's a feature of the method, right? The result should be true. That's right. So the result, the result should be true for all G positive, uh, but our method is definitely restricted to small g. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's thank the speaker.